Book Guys show is brought to you by Audible. Go to bookguys.ca slash audible and get a free book just for trying them out for one month. This is the Book Guys Show. My name is Paul Alves, and we are joined by a great panel today, as always, Sir Jimmy, all the way from North Carolina. How you doing, Sir Jimmy? Doing fantastic. Uh, you need to come. You need to come down and see us here in North Carolina someday soon. There's so many wonderful treats here that you're uh, you're being, you know, being denied. Guess, you're in Canada, so you're missing out on you know the hog farms down here, and you know tobacco fields. And I am running out of the ghost peppers. So I might have to go down just to fill up. Oh, hey, I was in the garden with uh, Nobot here just a few days ago, and we got one bed planted. We've, but it's cold weather crops. You know, you wouldn't be interested in, like, cabbage and broccoli and lettuce. Yeah, it doesn't mail well. It just really nah. doesn't. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll show you after you, the break uh, one thing I'm going to be doing with uh, some of the dried ghost peppers, which is putting them in olive oil. We'll, we'll do that after the break. Completely not related to books. <laughs> but you know what is related to books? Our guest... Today, special guest, William Kent Kruger, all the way from, I believe you're in St. Paul, Minnesota now, are you not? That's absolutely correct. Okay. A wonderful city. William, William Kent Kruger, of course, he's the New York Times bestselling author of the Cork O'Connor series, but that's not what we're going to talk about today. Today, we're going to talk about his new book, and I got it right here, Ordinary Grace. Oh, what a lovely cover. What a love! You know, I got to say, Kent, this is one of the loveliest co uh, covers for an advanced reader that I've ever seen. <laughs> and to be honest, I you started know, the book yesterday, so my review, I, I can give it in visual <laughs> here. I am about, I'd say, uh, an eighth of an inch of the way from finishing. Uh, just been immersed in it. Um, what? You what, want me to what tell you how it ends? Oh, no, please don't spoil it. No, covering my ears. <laughs> uh, so, Kent... Uh, first question, before we talk about you, I want to talk about Ordinary Grace. What made you take this break from the, the Cork, the very successful Cork O'Connor series to, to do a standalone like Ordinary Grace? You know, every once in a while a story comes to you, um, and it's so compelling that, uh, that it haunts you until you've written it. And that was Ordinary Grace for me. It came to me about four, somewhere between four and five years ago. I was under contract for the Cork O'Connor series. I had contractual obligations to meet. I tried to put the story aside, um, but it wouldn't go away. So finally, I cleared the decks, and over the course of the next two and a half or three years, every moment I had that wasn't devoted to my contractual obligations was spent completing the manuscript for Ordinary Grace, because it was a book that just spoke to my heart. It, it's, it's, you're, you're a poet. I mean, I, I have yet to read the Cork O'Connor series. It's on my to-do to list. But uh, after uh, after reading Ordinary Grace, uh, it's definitely uh, it's uh, probably going to read it next. Uh, I enjoy audiobooks. Well, I got to tell you this: the the Cork O'Connor series is poetry too, with a few murders thrown in. With a few, well, there you know, well, there's a couple of uh, uh, bodies have shown up already in this book. Now, now, tell us a little bit about the story of Ordinary Grace. Ordinary Grace takes place in the summer of 1961. It's set in a small town deep in the very beautiful Minnesota River Valley. It's the story of a Methodist minister whose beloved child is murdered. But the heart of the story, really, is the question of what that terrible tragedy does to this man's faith, his family, and ultimately the entire fabric of the small town in which he lives. That's pretty much the down and dirty. And, and it's all told through the eyes of one of the children of the, the priest, Frank, I believe, Frankie? Yeah, 13-year-old Frank Drum is the narrator, and he's really narrating the story from the distance of about 40 years later. So it's kind of a tricky thing to pull off in terms of point of view, because you've got, you've got to somehow incorporate both, both the voice of a 50-year-old man, and it has to sound at various times as if it's a 13-year-old boy. It was, a, it was a great challenge, and I had a lot of fun with it. Now, one of the reviews I saw was from uh, Dennis uh, Lane, uh, the author of Shutter Island. And where he said, pitch, uh -huh. pitch perfect. And he basically stole the title of my review, I think. Uh, you did that wonderfully. <laughs> the, the telling, uh, Frankie's telling the story uh, as an older man and, and still going back. And it's almost like at the same time he's analyzing what he did at the time. Uh, it's written beautifully. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, Kent. Uh, are you are in St. Paul, Minnesota now? 
Uh, I moved here about 30 years ago so that my wife could go to the University of Minnesota Law School. Before that, I was a gypsy kid. I lived all over the place. I honestly, I never had any place that I thought of as home. But the minute I set foot in Minnesota, I knew I'd found I'm absolutely in love with this place. So I knew all of my writing basically was going to be somehow a, a homage to this adopted home of mine. Where does the Cork O'Connor series take place? Is it also in Minnesota? It takes place in an area we call the Arrowhead, which is very northern Minnesota. Uh, runs along the, the uh, border with Canada, uh, an area of just deep woods and, uh, and pristine waters, uh, wild, wild country. Uh, the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness is up there. It's the most used wilderness area in the United States, and it's just stunningly beautiful uh, topography. When did you start writing, Kent? When did that become your passion? <laughs> I, have, I have always written. My father was a high school English teacher, uh, so he introduced me to literature very, very early on. I grew up with stories, and I grew up always wanting to be one of the storytellers. So I have always written it, simply that I served a very long apprenticeship before I could actually make a living at it. You know, all you put in the time, definitely. Uh, Ordinary Grace, a fantastic novel, standalone, uh, completely separate from the, the Cork O'Connor universe. Uh, are we going to see some more standalone stories from you, or is it time? Are you returning after this uh, tour for Ordinary Grace? Are you going to go back to the, the Cork O'Connor series? Well, we just finished the negotiations with my publisher for a three-book contract. Um, which includes two Cork O'Connor stories and one that's not a part of the Cork O'Connor series. And is in fact a sister novel to Ordinary Grace. It's called This Tender Land. It also takes place in southern Minnesota in the, in the late 50s. Fantastic, fantastic. Ordinary Grace and a story. How, how long has this story been, uh, like you were saying, brewing? All, all my life, basically. I, uh, I mind a lot of my own experiences for Ordinary Grace. One of the things that I have for a very long time wanted to do was to write a story that would allow me to go back into my own. 13, that 12, 13-year-old um, time frame for males, I don't know if it's the same for women, but for, for it's a very important uh, time in their lives because it's that point in time where you're, you're about to leave your adolescence and enter manhood. It's this threshold, and it's a very important emotional time. And I wanted to capture that, that um, emotions, the feelings, the memories that I had as I passed through that threshold. And, and I've wanted to do that for a very long time. Ordinary Grace uh, allowed me that opportunity. From what I could read, you're not, you're not the son of a minister. <laughs> okay, uh, was your neighbor the son of a minister, or are you just a... Uh, are you a spiritual man? Are you a religious person? Because uh, it just really, it almost comes across as if you really knew what it was like to, you know, be the, the son of the minister and, you know, that kind of a strict household. And Well, I know a lot of PKs, uh, preacher's kids. Um, so, so growing up, uh, I, ha I got all their stories. When I uh, was conceiving, first conceiving the novel, for the, the whole idea for Ordinary Grace, I originally thought of making uh, making the father a teacher because that's what my father was. Right. But because I really wanted to talk about spiritual issues, um, a minister sounded a whole lot better. And I wanted the kid to be kind of a kid who was who saw himself as uh, as a bit of a rebel. Um, he knew he was kind of a disappointment, and it's much easier to be disappointing as a minister's kid than as a high school English teachers kid, you know? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Ordinary Grace, and it comes out in, Mar I believe, next month in March. March 26th. I'll be talking about it uh, again next week after I finish. And, uh, you know, <laughs> it's going to be... I hope be... you enjoy it all the way through. Oh, I, 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 I'm sure I will. I just can't, I can't wait to finish. Uh, it's, it's a sad thing when you finish a book, and a happy thing, but it's still sad because there's no more story. There's no more until you the know next what I... one. What I really hope is is that people, when they have finally closed the book, wish that the story would go on. Yes. They've fallen in love with this place and with these people, um, and they'd love to spend more time with them. It's, it's a brilliant. I hope that uh, you were saying there's a sister novel. I hope that we get to see some of these characters from the small town again someday, and maybe some of them will, will uh, show up in the next one. <laughs> 
You know, I have no intention of bringing back the cast from Ordinary Grace. I'm creating sort of a new set of characters in a, in a, a different town and in a slightly earlier period of time. Uh, this Tenderland is going to be a novel that deals significantly with uh, the aftermath of World War II and uh, what that, that terrible experience did when we returned home from it. Hey, William, this is uh, Sir Jimmy here. I've got a question. Since I haven't read the book, the one thing that uh, that comes up to me, you said you just got through with negotiations with, with your publisher to uh, to put out a few more books. And yes. when, let's say, all right, you, you spend it some, you just finished up a book, you know, you're doing it on tour and you, you don't have any like irons in the fire right now. What is the difference in your day-to-day life and just your mindset and uh, when you when you have a deadline or you've got an agreement, I mean, do you have a deadline? Do you have like a certain time period you have to get book one out, book two? Is there an order? And just what's different about when you've got something cooking as opposed to when you don't? I never have nothing cooking. You know, I really feel at sea if I'm not actually at work on a project. Uh, and typically, as soon as I finished uh, a particular a particular contracted piece of writing. I'm ready to jump into the next one. And in fact, generally speaking, I will have already planned out the next project. I'll have a a pretty good outline in my head for what I want the story to be. Um, I know when the deadline's going to roll around, so knowing after all all these many years how long it takes me to write a novel, I can make uh, plans about uh, uh, where I have to be at particular points prior to the deadline. But the basic thing is, is I love writing more than I love Almost anything except my wife and my children. Yeah, very good, very good. So uh, if I'm not writing, I'm not. <laughs> it's it's Valentine's Day. I had to throw that in tomorrow. That's right. Um, if if I'm not writing, I'm not a happy camper. Is basically it. Absolutely, and it shows in, uh, oh, in your work. My my wife's birthday is Valentine's Day, so a a lovely shout out to Mister Jimmy. <laughs> Ha- happy 29 <laughs> <laughs> mr jimmy i love it the anonymity i love it <laughs> uh william uh, sorry i keep calling you william because it's on the cover here kent uh, don't I know, worry I, about it no no problem i know you've got a, a plane to catch at some point so um uh, we're gonna keep it short today and we're gonna go to the break and uh, we're gonna do our book news but i hope you would come back again sometime and uh, sit with us for a whole show and just discuss the book industry and books and audio books and uh, maybe we'll have some other interesting guests on maybe we could uh, bribe you by having so you know some interesting <laughs> people to talk to instead of just us schmoes <laughs> hey you guys are plenty interesting let me tell you and uh, thanks for having me and yeah anytime you want me uh, back on i'm yours excellent and uh tune in next week i'll be talking about ordinary grace i'll be saying all the things i can't say while you're here <laughs> right. i'm just kidding <laughs> you take care paul you take care sir jimmy take care ken nice to meet you We'll see you next time. All the dying that summer began with the death of a child, a boy with golden hair and thick glasses. Killed on the railroad tracks outside New Bremen, Minnesota, sliced into pieces by a thousand tons of steel speeding across the prairie toward South Dakota. His name was Bobby Cole. It was a summer in which death and visitation assumed many forms. Accident, nature, suicide, murder. My father used to quote the Greek playwright Aeschylus, he who learns must suffer. And even in our sleep, pain which cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart until in our own despair against our will comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. I still spend a lot of time thinking about the events of that summer, about the terrible price of wisdom, the awful grace of God. Hi, I'm William Kent Kruger. You may know me as the author of the New York Times bestselling Cork O'Connor Mystery Series. This year, I'll be offering readers something very different. It's not a Cork O'Connor novel, but it's the best thing I've ever written. Sometimes as an author, you're given a story. It comes to you, just comes. And it's so compelling, 
that it haunts you until you've written it. For me, that was ordinary grace. Set in the summer of 1961, in a small town deep in the beautiful Minnesota River Valley, Ordinary Grace is the story of a Methodist minister whose beloved child is murdered. That's the compelling mystery part. The real heart of the story is how that terrible tragedy affects this man's faith, his family, and ultimately the entire fabric of the small town in which he lives. Kirkus, in its lovely starred review, called Ordinary Grace a novel that transforms narrator and reader alike. Dennis Lehane, New York Times bestselling author of Mystic River, Shutter Island, and The Given Day, thinks Ordinary Grace is pitch perfect and declared quite simply, I loved this book. I put everything I know about storytelling into this book, and I promise you, you won't be disappointed. And we're back, and we are joined. The panel has expanded. <laughs> Joining us uh, all the way from Central Ohio. I'm trying to find his jingle. Here we go. Professor Allen. Yeah. How you doing, Professor? Hey, can I get to do a promo for weeks when I'm not here? <coughs> Father Robert. <coughs> Father Robert Velliser, <laughs> digital Jesuit. Yeah, yeah. That's a good idea, actually. <laughs> we should. We should record promos after the show. Uh, <laughs> Sir Jimmy, of course, still with us. And joining us all the way from CYMEK.com, CYMEK.com, Craig Damelo, our co-host on the Emergency Broadcast System. How are you doing, my friend? Good. I am uh, in Alabama tonight, so uh, excuse me if I speak slowly. <laughs> Ooh, we just Ooh, lost hey. all our Alabama listeners. <laughs> Alabamians. <laughs> uh, so, Craig, where, where are you uh, based handle, out of Craig. usually? Where, where usually I'm in Seattle, Washington. Yeah, usually in Seattle. There's usually rain yeah. behind you and a big space needle type thing. So you got, you got yeah, just a little a, culture shock? Uh, a little bit, yeah. Actually, you know what? It's it's Huntsville, so it's, it's an odd place uh, because of... I mean, literally all rocket scientists. So um, it's a culture shock more than you would expect. And uh, Sir Jimmy, I see the guitar behind you, and I know that you've been reading something this week. You were kind of flashing yeah, it there uh, during the break. It's an early Valentine's Day present. Uh, it's the ultimate guitar chords book. And I'm assuming it is the ultimate um, since it's in the title. Um, they're going to make no that more. That's it. It's the last yeah, one. This is it. This is all you need. You're, th it, there's, this is the last one. I think they're going to... Okay. There's not... It's compiled by Nick Freeth. Okay. So, credit to the compiler. Is it, is it helping any? Absolutely. <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I'm learning... Are you almost like, ready to like do the background music for the show? Or Sure. If you want to hear like the in intro to... Uh, uh, several different songs. That's about it. Sure, why not? Yeah. <laughs> Don't tell <laughs> I haven't, YouTube. Haven't got any letters from the RIA lately, so might as yeah, well go for I, it. I can. I can definitely I can name use some more practice. I can name <laughs> yeah. that song in two notes. <laughs> for, <laughs> Professor Allen, anything new on your nightstand? Kindle, Kobo. Well, I uh, or, I just finished up uh, just finished up the Hunger's Game uh, book and. As I boldly stepped into 2008 for that reading experience, I decided to go back another hundred years and decided this year, 2013, I'm going to reread the uh, Sherlock Holmes. Uh, have you the seen the movie? Have you I seen have the not, Hunger Games movie? No. I have not. That is next on my list, though. Yeah, I would be I, interested I, to hear your thoughts. I didn't want to be spoiled. So I'm working my way through Sherlock Holmes and have just started a, a study in Scarlet, the first the first novel wonderful. the origin story wonderful detective stories i'm uh, looking forward to revisiting them this year yes arthur conan doyle i can never say that right i don't know why it's a problem with my brain conan <laughs> conan conan lamentation conan. of your women conan what is best in life to crush your enemies see them driven before you to hear a lamentation of the women. 
That is good. Hey, Crank, anything yes. new on your iPod or on your nightstand this week? Uh, actually, I just finished Hunger Games last week or the week before. I can't remember. And I started reading uh, the second one, whatever, Catching Fire. Nice. But I have already seen the first movie, so the book was already ruined for me. But uh, not really because it – I don't know. I, I don't want to ruin the movie for yeah. anybody, <laughs> but uh, – there's a lot missing. Yeah, it was condensed, of course. Yeah, you know, unless Peter Jackson does it, it's condensed. Yeah. But when they blow up the Death Star at the end, I thought that was pretty awesome. Oh, oh, spoiler! Come on. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm just finishing. Like I was saying earlier in the show, when we were talking to uh, William Kent Kruger, uh, this book here, Ordinary Grace. Lots of fun. 1961, small town, Minnesota. Bodies, murder, murder talk about that next week when I finish the book <laughs> and we've got a bunch of book news gentlemen book news all right I know you're ready to get into some comic book news professor but we got we got some other stuff other things going on uh, brushed on it last week Maurice Sendak's final book is due out this month uh, where the well things are authors last completed work my brother's book is a tribute to his own brother uh, this is uh, 50 years now after the iconic Where the Wild Things Are is uh, published. Uh, his his final completed book uh, that he wanted to uh, release posthumously uh, is a tribute to his brother. Uh, inspired by Shakespeare's The Winner's Tale and influenced by the drawings of William Blake. Uh, it's a story of two brothers, Jack and Guy, separated from each other when the brightest star in the sky smashes. Jack is flung to continents of ice and Guy to the lair of a bear, but they are eventually reunited. Uh, it's, it's written and illustrated by Sendak, much like uh, Wild, the Wild Things are. Uh, it, it's a moving homage to his brother, and uh, Harper Collins is actually saying that this is probably uh, his most important work. Of course, they'd say that, because it's, it's the last one that he's ever going to write, but uh, they're saying it's a very good book. Uh, tribute to his brother, coming out this month. That's Has it been optioned for a movie yet? <laughs> probably. I would guess. <laughs> if not, they're neg negotiating right now with the family. You know. Do you have any plans for anything posthumously? A lot of pissed off credit card companies. That's about it. <laughs> Damn it, he's dead. Crap. <laughs> Does he have any, uh, what's the next again? Where are they at? <laughs> oh. And our last story before we get into some comic book news. What do you guys think of this? Anna Green Gables, of course, uh, Ludie, uh, Lucy Maud Ludie. <laughs> That's going to be her new name. That's it. Ludie Maud yeah. Montgomery's classic tale uh, has been re-released, a uh, new edition. And the big controversy here is this is the lady on the cover. Hey, now. Hey. Prince Edward Island. Um, I hope. Yeah. Anna Green Gables is a redhead, and they put a blonde on the cover with these bedroom eyes, and <laughs> everyone's basically, but she's a kid, no, this is wrong. So it looks like they're going to be um, recalling this edition and uh, shredding them and returning oh. this classic character's uh, hair color to where it should be. We call that a collector's item where I come from. Collector's item. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah, any Marvel right. comic where Nick Fury is white. <laughs> 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 but I mean, is this such a big deal? Okay, I understand the bedroom eyes thing. Maybe they want to class it up and just... The same lady, you can have the same lady on the cover, change the pose maybe. So it wasn't, you know, it didn't look like it was supposed to be a, like a Shades of Grey novel. But uh, is it a big deal changing the hair color? It's not Anne of Red Hair Gables. Yeah, <laughs> If you haven't read it, who knows? What's the big deal? Uh, pretty much. Pretty much. Who cares? Change I learned color. something. I didn't know. Now yeah. you tell me it's a redhead in the story. I want to read it. <laughs> you know? Where can I get a coffee? <laughs> hey, from, from red hair, let's go to purple and green hair. Purple hair and green skin. Comic books. Comic books. Comic books. All right. They're doing it. Uh, Professor Allen, always don't want to get your opinion on any of these comic things that happen. So Marvel, with the success of its... Of course, Marvel now owned by... Uh, they're, they're Disney, aren't they not now? They are owned by Disney. And Lock, stock, and... Disney oh. knows how to squeeze every penny out of Mickey Mouse's butt and every other property they own. Uh, it looks like, with the success of the movies, Marvel is looking into doing some chiclet, full-on fiction novels. First one, as you can see from the picture here, 
It's green lipstick with a purple background. Uh, the first in the series is going to be She-Hulk. Is going to be played the- by uh, China from the WWE. <laughs> <laughs> Hyperion is the uh, the publisher. Uh, chief editor in chief Elizabeth Dysigard, uh says we think the books will definitely appeal to comic readers, male and female, but also draw a new crowd of women readers who will be introduced to superheroes through a medium they already love. Uh, that's what I want to ask you, uh, Fresh Allen. Do you think that introducing these comic characters to, uh, let's say, a chick lit uh, reader, do you think that's going to bring them to comic books? Well, you know, in 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 terms of of ladies and comic books, girls and comic books, the it's mostly you know their 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 manga people is really where they're strongest. Not so much in the comics, though. The Avengers movie has certainly helped. And uh, you know anything anything you can do to bring in a different type of readership, they've tried this to to bring in younger, you know to 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 target you know back you know the younger kid audience to target target a female audience. I'm I'm all for it. This now this is not the first time they've uh, Marvel has done this. It is the first time under obviously under Disney. But there were a couple of Mary Jane novels. Uh, young okay. adult novels that were written maybe six to eight years ago by uh, Judith O'Brien. I think there were two that were obviously uh, inspired by inspired by the ultimate Spider-Man take on Mary Jane. Now, I don't have information here on who is actually writing um, the story. What's an interesting press release. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but we're putting out a book. Yeah. Who cares who wrote it? It's She-Hulk. But, but Marvel has done a whole bunch of novels, uh, from Spider-Man to uh, Fantastic Four and X-Men. So they've you know, they've done prose, you know, young adult prose novels before. What makes this one unique is the specific uh, targeting the I think it's, female I think it's tar- targeting an, an older reader as well. I think mm-hmm. you're looking more in a risque type thing. It says here that it's called <laughs> the She-Hulk Diaries, uh, which of course comes with the image of that green lipstick on its cover. Uh, Jennifer Walters, the main character, is a corporate lawyer and sometimes green rampager who is looking for love. <laughs> I got I got a sign up there, Kitty. What what what's going on, Sir Jimmy? Look in the background sh- right there. Oh, hey, Kitty. It looks like a skunk there. Now you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Allen, what's your Kitty's name? That is. Uh, let me just say before I tell you the name, named before the book series. That okay. is Twilight. No re no relation. I swear. <laughs> okay. Twilight the kitty. Twilight the kitty. All right. Does it have anything to do with the color scheme there? That is correct. Okay. You got day and night. I see that. Exactly. You know. well, exactly. She's more than. Welcome hey, let me ask you the something. The only, a comic book question. Where, Professor Allen, do you buy your comic books? Yeah, good. Do question. you have a comic book store? You get them at the. Gro- I, you used to be at the grocery store. I don't yeah, know where you even get that's one. That's the. Pro- I mean, that's. That's the problem. You have to buy them through comic shops. I do not buy new comics very rarely. There are two that my daughter and I are reading, two series. Mostly I buy old stuff at the comic book store, like literally out of the 25-cent bin. Or Mm -hmm. what I read new is about a few months old out of trade paperbacks when they collect them, usually from the public library. If they're good enough, I'll buy them. Yeah. public library system here in Columbus, Ohio has a ton of graphic novels. That is a great place to start if someone so, wants to. So you're saying you're doing nothing to support the comic book industry? Uh, talking about it and <laughs> blogging about it and... Uh, I guess. Alright, you're doing more than most then. I take that back. I'm sorry. And, and buying a couple a month. All and right. you know, uh, yes. Teresa the librarian who's going to join me uh, at Toronto Comic Con in March... Uh, she does that as well. She she buys the collections as trade paperbacks or when they're collected, because uh, obviously they're. It's nice to have a larger book that isn't as flimsy, and uh, it's nice to have the whole story. You can just sit and go through the whole thing, and she usually gets them for her library, and uh, you can find some great deals. Your local comic con, go oh, there. Lots of long boxes. I was listening to one one comic podcast. I do not remember what show it was off the top of my head but they were actually talking to an on, a guy that does web comics and online comics and and then sell and he says the and, and sort of the question was what's the best way to support like Jimmy said what's the best way to support your local artist mm-hmm. and and they said you know buy the 
I mean, do you get more out of the trade? Do you get more out of the single issues? And the answer was the best thing to do is buy directly from us at a convention. That's ah, the biggest markup for the for the artist. You know, for the, like T-shirts then, at a concert. I guess, exactly. yeah. So then they're, they're acting like the store where they, they'll get the 75%. They get the store cut. They get the retail. Right. They get the retail cut. Makes sense. Hey, Craig, I bet you didn't know you were coming on here to talk about comics. <laughs> we talk about... Do we talk about books on tape? What? What is das? Okay, I went really old Cassette. school with the, Sherlock, with the Sherlock Holmes. It took about three days, but I actually did find a Walkman in the house. So I can actually listen to it. Now, did you use rechargeable batteries, or did it cost you $28 to listen to the book? Rechargeable, baby. <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> I'm green and cheap. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, so now i got to say what's on your Kindles, nightstands, your iPads... <laughs> Cassette players, VHS tapes. <laughs> Only for a few Laser more days. Laser discs. <laughs> <laughs> Laser discs are great. They make great yeah. throwing weapons. Oh, yeah. Reel to reel, eight track. Uh, friend, friend of the Book Guy show, Orson Scott Card, has been tasked uh, to write a Superman story for online. I think it's an online, you know, digital, for one of their digital comics. Mm -hmm. And there's been some controversy uh, or or uh, complaints because of of some of some of Card's political positions, and DC just responded today and basically said that you know we support freedom of expression and personal views of people associated with us, our personal. You and, know, it all comes down because uh, Or Orson Scott Card is. Uh, he belongs to the, the Church of uh, Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and uh, their stance, official stance, is against gay marriage. Um, I hate to tell, you know, it's people that are freaking out over this. First of all, um, Superman was written by two Jewish fellows, and I can tell you how many open, openly gay uh, Jewish couples are sitting in temple right now. <laughs> so, unless Orson Scott Card writes a story where Superman you know, beats the crap out of gay people in the middle of the street, what does it have to do with the story? Hey, yep. th hi, Noah, we're not talking about anything risque. How you doing, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> How's Noah doing? We're talking about, <laughs> we're going to be talking about space I'm marines doing, soon. Um, Carolina good. Carolina good. <laughs> is that me? How you good is Carolina, Carolina good? good? Yeah, that's right. Because Toronto good gets pretty Carolina good, but... Good? Um, so good that they're going to beat Duke. Oh, so good that they're going to beat Duke, apparently. Nice. Good night. <laughs> good night, buddy. Comic <laughs> books and college basketball all in one show. So so what do you think, Professor Allen? I mean, uh, Orson Scott Card, I, I'm looking forward to this comic. Yeah. Does it matter right. what his personal views are? Unless he writes them into the story. That's what right. I mean. Right. And I, 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 you know, I, I actually think it was handled pretty well. You know, he exercised his right to free speech protesters exercise their right to free speech and dc Comics says everyone can speak freely and we're gonna publish him because he's a a great author and i've been to a uh, lot to of me, comic that's sort of a win 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 yeah well have you met some of these artists and writers at the comic cons i'm sure some of them are satanists for christ's sake some of them are probably serial killers you know but as long as they don't write it into the story I don't. I don't know if comic book uh, readers are the same way as uh, when when they get upset about other things like musicians. Like I think it was, I don't know, ten years ago probably when Marilyn Manson, the r church groups kept buying up his concert tickets so people couldn't see it. He kept getting the money. You know, I wonder if this will work the same way. Will Superman comic sales or the digital ones go up? Right. Because people are trying to. I don't know, burn digital books or whatever you do to digital <laughs> books. You know, and it's, it's you know what, who, who knows where this all came from and maybe, you know, maybe DC could have spiked the, you know, thing a little bit. You know, <laughs> get the rumor going and now we're talking about it. It works. With, with him writing it and his political views, will Superman start carrying a gun? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Will his underwear be, you know, on the outside of his uh, costume still, or uh, who knows? Well, he's faster than a speeding bullet. Hey, now. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he and Jimmy Olsen are just close friends also, by the way. That's right.
They're just friends. Hey, I got some more superhero news here as well. American comics creator, it's not news, but uh, uh, we're talking about Space Marines. The, the term Space Marines uh, apparently is copyrighted by the company that does 40,000 Warhammer. What's it called? War TSR? Games Workshop. Warhammer 40,000 is the name of the game. So they've apparently got a copyright on the term Space Marine. And I can tell you that I'm listening to a, a book right now uh, on Audible called Star Strike, which in Space Marine term is used so many times in it. But apparently they've kept copywritten this generic term and uh, people are being sued. And writer MCA Hograth, Hogarth reported that her novel Spots the Space Marine had been removed from sale by Amazon after representatives from Game Workshop said, hey, hey, we, we own Space Marine. That wasn't a story really for me because, you know what, eh, it'll work itself out in court. But then when I saw this, I had to talk to Professor Allen about it. Do you know that the word superheroes and the term superheroes... Hi, love, how are you? <laughs> is, that, is, is that Lady Jimmy? That's Mr. Jimmy. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's my uh, girlfriend slash wife. Oh, oh, she knows superheroes, she said. And she knows everything about Hogwarts and the Hunger Games, so yes. anytime. It's, it's, it's nice to have a wife and a girlfriend. You, you know, usually there are two people, but it, if, if it could just be one, that's If it fine works, too. whatever works. It's a, ju <laughs> it's a juggling act. <laughs> so um, American comics writer Ray Felix, according to an interview he did last week with CrispComics.com, which is also a nice site, He's currently locked into a trademark battle with Marvel and DC over the word superhero. And I didn't know that the big two, Marvel and DC, they applied for and got trademarks and copyright across the world together as a joint effort on the word superheroes and the term superheroes. So, so they didn't want to fight the whole world for that term. They didn't and want they to said, fight each other. Join forces. That's right, because they knew that each other had billion-dollar lawyers, <laughs> right? Exactly. So, so Ray Felix applied to trademark his comic book title, which is "A World Without Superheroes," and Marvel and DC said, mm -mm, "Not happening." And I, act, I, I actually you. think, I, I actually think the Space Marine one is actually a decent case potentially. I mean, the rule, the trade, the trademark rule is. If if this could cause confusion, right? And if you have, you know, Space Marine is usually in a context of a particular branded a video game, and you're throwing it on the title of a book, not in a book, but in a title of a book to sell the book, you could certainly argue. I mean, there there is a there is an argument that they are selling that that title of the book based on people's familiarity with the term from another context we, we need a lawyer because do they not look at prior use i mean you can go all the way back to bob heinlein's starship yep. troopers which i think right from my recollection is the the yeah, first space marine yeah. story and that's like fifth we're talking 40s and 50s uh would not i'm not be, saying they'd win the lawsuit i'm saying it's a, it's a, a to me that's a more legitimate case perhaps than this right superhero seems to me very generic just off the top of my head. Yeah, you know, especially seeing as, you know, the DC and Marvel superheroes weren't the first actual superheroes, although maybe right. not named by that name in the right. title of the book. Ah, I You should know. just change the book to a world without DC and Marvel. <laughs> <laughs> a world without Disney and Warner Brothers. Yeah. <laughs> you know, now let's say the first time the Marines from the United States of America go into space... <laughs> Are they going to have to, like, fight for the title? I mean, it's it's ridiculous, but you wouldn't... You know, Disney owns the, the trademark and the copyright on the uh, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police's uniform. Like, the, the RCMP right. and the logo. So it's not that far-fetched that, uh, you know, the, the Marines, at one point in the future, when they do go into space, you know, by, aboard the, the weaponized Hubble, <laughs> you know, <laughs> might have to pay uh, a royalty to, to somebody. To the nice people at uh, Games Workshop. I don't know. And what do we have next week, Jimmy? I know what we have next week. We're all looking forward to this one. Jeff Gurner, actor and audiobook narrator. I know uh, I spent at least 40 hours listening to him. He read me bedtime stories. At least 40 <laughs> hours worth of bedtime stories. 
that we call on audible cassette tape on a cassette no. <laughs> <laughs> i actually i always use the audible app on my phone uh, just because it's smaller and less cumbersome to bring into bed but i noticed today that I, you know, I went to install the audible app on the ipad and let me show you what it looks like it's just a big iphone app Actually, if I unclick oh, that I button, if I unclick this button here, that's what it looks like. Yeah, I can't believe Amazon hasn't updated. That. Come on, Amazon, you get can't off your double butt. size it. Fills up at one quarter of the well, screen. Yeah, you can. You can double size it, but it looks oh, like. Okay. Poop. Yeah, it still sucks. They always. Look I'll like stop poop. by Bezos's house on the way home tomorrow. Yeah, let him know. Hey, Come Bezos, on. <laughs> what's with these crappy apps? What's going on? <laughs> it's a great I app. I the Jeff Gurner app where you can turn any book into being read by Jeff Gurner. And what I did notice, though, <laughs> I did test. As soon as I opened up my app on my iPad, freshly downloaded, it did say, um, I downloaded the audiobook and it said, hey, 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 you're in chapter three on your other device. Would you like to resume the exact same point? And I said, you got it, man. Works. There you go. Well, that one comes in handy. And of course, audibletrial.com slash book guys. Check out Jeff Gurner. You can search by audiobook narrator. Check out Jeff Gurner. Get one of his books that he's narrated. Uh, what would you suggest, Sir Jimmy? I would suggest going with, uh, well, I liked Kill Decision, but um, I thought, you know, Kill Decision, because it is so much more about what's going on right now. Yeah, and I still I have, that's the I'm, one I haven't read. I need to take a, a Jeff Gurner break. So, I'm writing it down Aha. in Sharpie. The bookmarking on the Audible thing, when, when uh, Noah and I were both reading uh, the same book at the same time, it would it would say, hey, you know, on your other device, you're at this point. Would you like to change it here? I'm like, oh, he's ahead of me. <laughs> Damn it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to take the long way to work, and I'm going to pass it. That, that is one, one of the great old. things about uh, just about any of these platforms, Android or, or the iOS is that when you download an app onto this device, it goes on your wife's and your kids, especially if you're sharing an account. Same with the Audible, like you just said. Right. You know, you uh, get your family together. If there's four, five of you, three of you, two of you, every book you buy, hey, your wife can listen to it too as well. You can share. Should be able to share with everyone. Unfortunately, you can't. We're running late, gentlemen. I know it's been a crazy night. It's been a crazy night. Still testing the uh, the video thing. Who knows? It might make it. This one might make it, guys. We still didn't shave, though. <laughs> Craig, thanks for joining us, my friend. We got to do an EBS soon because they're setting cops on fire in California. Yeah, sorry about the. <laughs> Professor Allen, thank you, sir. Glad to be here. Sir Jimmy, we're going to be joined next week, hopefully by Sir Father Robert Balliser and Jeff Gurner. It's going to be a lot of fun. And we're back with episode yes, 68. Hey. Ah, Skype. The joys of Skype. I hate you, Skype! See you next week, folks. <laughs> Stay tuned, book readers and book Same listeners. Time. Same time. Paul channel. the Book Guy will be back next week. Same book time. Same book channel. I really hate Skype.